Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Alexis. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Oh, no, thank you for coming on. I, I, I said on my a previous interview with somebody, I said, I'm always still delighted and surprised as well when people ask to come on the on the podcast that I go, yeah, I've got another guest. And although I've been doing this for like six years, I'm still really excited, surprised. Uh, I, I don't know. I just love stories. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing yours. Um, so it's good to have a British per- person on the show. I, I do attract a lot of American people, so it's good to hear an English accent. Uh, I was on a uh, LinkedIn Live with somebody. I don't know if you ever heard a program called The Moral Maze. Yes. Yeah, Radio 4. Yeah. yeah it was very similar to that. And there were two Americans and two British people on it. Mm-hmm. And they told us that our accents are like gold in America. And I went, really? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm in the wrong place. I must go over there. There you go. Um, yeah. Okay, Alexis, I start with a really simple, very open-ended question, and it goes something like this. Alexis, why don't you share your story and how you got to where you are today? Very, very happy to. And thank you again for, for having me on, Michael. It's, uh, you shouldn't be surprised that guests reach out to you. You put out, put out great content and uh, and people will flock. So no, it's, uh, Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, what you're doing is fantastic. So uh, in terms of my story, I mean, I was always an entrepreneurial kid um, back when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, probably before, but I just can't remember it. Um, I was always trying to create things. And initially okay. it was with lemonade bottles and toilet roll tubes. Uh, but uh, but then by the by around then, sort of 11, 12, 13, it was essentially my own little mini businesses, whether it was selling news making and selling newsletters or uh, uh washing cars and sweeping drives and uh then a bit later uh mowing lawns when i was then old enough to relatively safely do so <laughs> <laughs> um and uh yeah I, I and then even when i got my first computer i started i, I kind of learned how to do a bit of code i, th- I thought that was fascinating how i could wow. create things that would be on the internet that people out yeah. there could access and so i even started creating online businesses with banner advertising and started receiving my first checks through the post uh paying paying me to uh, to do these things yeah. um and so i always imagined back when i was sort of that age that i would create a vast business empire wow. um i had no idea why that was important to me <laughs> 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 and, and and to some extent we'll we'll ex- i'm sure as we'll explore like my journey mm. is, is probably one of um learning how to uh, let go of a of a lot of a lot of things and hang ups, including goal, meaningless goals, uh, and instead sort of finding what was really uh, what was really important, but also uh, finding routes that allow me to utilize my strengths to to achieve the goals that really matter to me. But um, yeah, back then I was kind of trying to start businesses, and uh, compared to children at that time, did pretty well. Yeah. However, against my own ambitions of building a global business empire, uh, I was I was really you know I was struggling. You know, I wasn't able to grow it beyond me essentially, and that yes. and every single time I hit this kind of blocker of just being busy and not being able to spread my time between you know my little side business and some mm. other hobbies and schoolwork, yes, um, meant meant that I would in the end kind of conclude ah this is the wrong. This is the wrong business. It's not scalable. I need to right. uh, to change, and hence then doing stuff online, and, and even then struggling to then scale that. Um, and so then I, uh, yeah, I went to I went to university thinking, well, that that'll, that'll uh, you know, I, I did business studies at A level actually before that, then management mm. science at university, which is basically a continuation. Thinking this, you know, I'll I'll learn I'll learn how to how to create my vast business empire yes and and over that time i still started up different businesses i was selling headsets back neck headsets you know those ones right yes. went right over the top of year around the back of the net um i was selling those on uh ebay uh so this is prior to 
like really before Amazon really took off, selling it on eBay and um uh, uh and trying to take take advantage of the boom in voice over IP that I was convinced was coming. That was that yes. was back when Zoom calls like this didn't exist. That wasn't like Correct. Skype was the the new company yes. on the scene. I and, remember um, it well. I remember yeah. it well. Yeah. <laughs> So I, um, yeah, I was just still trying to build businesses. I started building computers and selling them. And yeah, again, still didn't grow the business, any of these businesses beyond me. And so having decided that I still couldn't work it out, I became a management consultant working with really large businesses like AstraZeneca and Honda and BP and um, other organizations like UK government and so on. Um, learning how do they operate at scale because i had failed <laughs> numerous times is that employed that with them uh employed. so i was a, a i was employed as a management consultant right uh by a company called pa consulting but i was then yes. um consulting into those businesses um, oh, i got you which um was uh hilarious and scary all at once because of course at that point although i'd had some jobs and and done various things um uh I was terrified of the fact that I was essentially coming out of university and being charged out at a thousand pounds a day into mm. these big companies and thinking, how the hell am I going to add that kind of value? Like if I don't add a thousand pounds of value today, tomorrow I have to add 2000. And by the end yes. of the week, I have to add 5,000 pounds of value. <laughs> like I couldn't, I was thinking oh, that's impossible. And it was terrifying. Um, but I remember the very first project that I had, I saw that, like, I was asked to basically watch what someone was doing, document it and capture it as a as a process diagram. And I'd been taught how to do that. Um, and 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 so so that later other smarter consultants with more experience would be able to improve that process and reduce the amount of time and as a result, creative efficiencies. And I remember sitting watching this person on my very first day and say, and um, they were working on this spreadsheet and they were copying down the, they're sort of retyping these formally. And I said, um, uh, why, why are you doing that? And they said, well, because each row, you need to have this particular calculation. I was like, no, no, no. I mean, why aren't you just like copying the cells down? And mm. they said, well, because the, the formula needs to change each time and thing. I'm like, yeah, yeah but you can, yeah. Gr you can drag this all the way down. And bear in mind, I mean, now we'd look at this as being bonkers that yes. this wasn't just, but bear in mind, this was, how long ago like 15 years ago right mm. and 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 the person that i was observing um was sort of late career probably just a, a few years away from retirement yes and, and so wasn't particularly well versed with it although mm. one might argue like this was a big part of their job every day mm. and so i literally just like said why don't you just copy it down like this and honestly their face was just like a picture because <laughs> I, I it was and and I don't think I had the emotional intelligence back then to really know what was going through their mind because mm. it must have been a weird mix of surprise and delight. At, oh, I can do this, but also fear of like what that would mean for their job and everything like. Um, but I, what I know that I felt in that moment was a sense of, oh, I can totally add a thousand pounds worth of value a day. Like if this is if this is what I've done, like in my first hour of being on client site, I think yeah. I can I can uh, add up uh, other uh, areas here. So that was kind of what I started in. But the other big thing that I took away from consulting, as, and I was there for kind of three years, was that organizations were growing and scaling and delivering amazing things through people and processes. You know, yeah. I was documenting processes, but ultimately needed people there. And it was that big realization that if I was going to grow my you know business empire or whatever. I needed to be able to um, to to build teams. I needed to be able yes. to build a business of excellent people um, who were following processes to uh, to get stuff done. Mm. And so that was the big epiphany for me. Right. Um, but I had a pretty uh, big obstacle in front of me before if I was going to overcome that, unfortunately. OK, hold on. Hold hold that for a minute. So I want to I want to literally wind back yeah. right to the beginning where you were saying about the early, even pre-teens kind of yeah. entrepreneurship. And so I'm curious, where in your family does 
entrepreneurship exist either mom and dad or even going further back is it in the was it in the dna basically that's what i'm wondering yeah so i, I think probably well definitely yes so my uh when i was growing up both my mum and dad were both running their own businesses separately right um and so one was running a training business the other one running a software business uh, really early days of software right um, and prior to that, my grandfather on my dad's side um, was uh, he did he had a building business. He was a builder and uh, and had um, did his building. So so yeah. And then my stepfather um, when uh, he came along later, a bit later in the story, although uh, when I was about seven or eight, so actually prior to running the businesses, yes. uh, he had a chain of uh, six, seven uh, pharmacies right Spencer, okay uh, yeah. so that for me explains a lot now yeah. i have interviewed a lot of small business people and this does come up quite a lot actually mm. this kind of entrepreneurship at a young age and why people all of a sudden become business people when they're really really young and you can trace it back so yeah. i think it's a real phenomena that if you're exposed to it even subtly Mm. As a young person, okay. you soak it up and you you kind of start to model, mirror what your folk are doing around you, you know, your your parents, siblings or whatever. Uh, I generally think it's a thing. I don't know if it's ever been researched, but from people I've interviewed, it repeats very often. So, yeah, I was just curious because it's not an accident that no. you became an entrepreneur in your mind and then started acting it out even yeah. in a tiny small way so yeah fantastic and then and then the other question i have is uh how old were you when you left university uh probably was a it would have been about i guess 20 21 something like that i guess yeah and when do you think how old were you when the epiphany happened uh yeah so uh probably when i was more about sort of 23 20 yeah or 20, 22 23 something like that 22 23 okay okay great all right I'll, i might come back to that later i was just curious about the age range where that happened because there is something obviously in your early to mid 20s that happens with the brain and that it matures you know so you you're what they call the frontal lobe, the executive, mm. starts to realize things that you hadn't realized before when you were younger, yeah. uh, like early 20s. So when you start getting closer to 24, 25, your brain starts to kind of go, ah, right, okay, I get it now. This is what life is about. Or like an epiphany like you had uh, at that moment in time. Okay, so we'd gone kind of quite a long way management consulting you were rocking it you were adding a thousand pound of value and then something happened you said you're about to say it didn't something interesting happened yeah yeah so I, I i kind of realized that okay great you know and i'm at that time i was enjoying being a management consultant i loved it you know adding adding value to companies and solving their biggest problems um, whether it was through improving their processes or improving other ways of working, you know, whether yes. um, and, and so on. And, and so I, I really enjoyed that. Um, but deep, deep down, I, you know, knew I still wanted to go and, you know, go back to the world of entrepreneurship. Yeah. And, of but the big real, uh, as you say, the big realization was that if I was going to do that, I, I suppose, as you say, like that development in me was realizing I can't do this on my own. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I remember reading books like by Richard Branson and so on when I was young, where he talked about surrounding himself with smart people and doing all of that. Mm -hmm. So, so I think, yeah, I need to, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna build, it's people and process. It's getting smart people around me. It's you know, mm -hmm. creating something. You know, actually building something that isn't just dependent on me. Yeah. Um, uh, and to that point, you know, uh, up up until that point, I'd struggled to do that, but now felt like, oh, okay, I know the answer. But I had a couple of. Um, blockers uh that were that were guests correlated so one was that i um uh was kind of uh really good at the consulting side and so yes. a lot of the encouragement i was getting was like stick to this like you're great at this mm. um and on the flip side i had uh 
two previous managers uh, and and my mum actually who was saying <laughs> that they thought I probably wouldn't be very good at managing people. Um, the, whether it was the my temperament back then or just my general approach and and so on yeah meant that it was felt like I didn't have the people skills and I agreed with them right it wasn't it wasn't like they were telling me like it upset me but yes I, I didn't disagree mm. and as a result was um, nervous hesitant reluctant to hire people because yeah. I thought well I can't you know I can't manage them I'm not going to be good at that and I think for a long time, that identity, holding that identity of I'm not a people person, I'm not a manager, held right. me back significantly. Yeah. Um, it, and, it, and it prevented me from addressing the behaviors and the, and the thinking that was uh, underpinning that. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and a lot of the changes in my journey, uh, you know, particularly since then, have come about when I've made a big change in my identity, when I've stopped yeah. thinking myself as one thing and, and changed that. Um, yeah. But that was one of the first first big ones to fall was um, deciding, you know, I'm not going to let that hold me back uh, and that I'll, I'll find a way. And so did leave the management consultancy uh, and probably took the biggest, most crucial and ultimately um, brilliant decision of uh, not going to business on my own, but instead having a business partner um, is my still to this day, my business partner, Paddy Mann, who was right. also a consultant at the time, uh, except he was in the software development uh, space. Yes. Um, and we both over you know, drinks and so on had discussed one day wanting to start a software business. And, and so that's what we did, or at least uh, the plan was that we would create a consulting business that gave us the time and the money to uh, give a space to then build a, a software business around the edges. How did you, how did you change that mindset of I'm not a good people manager to becoming, I'm not going to let that stop me. And I'm going to change the narrative that's going on that people have influenced me that I then accepted stopping that program. Did you go on a course? Did you get some, coaching how did that come about how or yeah. did you change it on your own <laughs> uh, no 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 I didn't so I did mm. uh, I did a few things um around the same time so uh so I, there were things that so there were books that I read so I was reading books like um the one minute manager and how to be a good mm. boss and and all yes. those sorts of things that they really helped I mm. also um, was uh, I became part of a mastermind group and um, and got some coaching as well uh, right. and crucially was around other business owners and leaders who had got teams and who I looked up to as being people who had built teams and seeming you know successfully and were managing people and so on mm. and both through <laughs> I suppose two sides one their encouragement um, yeah. and and advice. But actually, one of the things I realized was that they weren't doing things that uh, that amazingly different. You know, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't that they were incredible people, people or that they um, uh, had very sophisticated ways of managing. Mm. You know, often it was just. Yeah, they 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 were they were doing it, and partly through experience and practice, um, mm. they they developed some of those skills. And in some cases, I'd look at what they were doing and be mortified by some of the things that they were doing and the results they were getting. And yet, it didn't seem to matter. I mean, it did have an impact, but it wasn't holding them back. No. And I think it was that realization of I am holding myself back more than my talents are. <laughs> um, and and it was that realization that, that led to me making some big changes. And and you already had some training how to manage people, didn't you? Yeah. Because the training was going to see clients and consulting with them yep. and convincing them there is a better way of doing things. So you already had to influence, persuade, suggest changes, yeah. get the best out of people. What's any different? <laughs> you know, it's no different to managing people. So you already 
unknowingly perhaps had that training for quite a long time yeah yeah true and and in theory like two years of business studies and four years of management science and whatever like in theory as you say I'd got that training I mm. think uh, and and arguably as a consultant some of management is harder because you're essentially asking people to give you information do stuff for you yes. without any direct control over their bonuses their promotion prospects their lives whatever like if a manager yes. says hey can you get this report to me by friday they have some power in the sense that you are they are your manager and can decide That's your right. your career as a consultant, particularly as a junior consultant, I didn't have that. I had to manage it through influence and um, yep. and building rapport and all those sorts of things. That's right. So I guess there were there were two things that I was concerned about and were the things that I struggled with uh, the most. One was um, the day to day management and particularly around um, sort of. It, it, it sounds really weird, but it's like the the caring about people's lives, the you know the the being aware of what's going on for them and asking questions, you know, like oh, how's the family and those sorts of those sorts of things used to terrify me for some unknown. Well, actually, it's not some unknown re reasons. I mm. now know, uh, as um, partly because my of my um, having a son and him going through uh, the diagnosis, I now know that I am uh, on the autistic spectrum, and so some of those things are not immediately obvious to me it doesn't pop into my head to ask like more probing questions about what's going on in someone's life yes if that's not the agenda if that's not the topic of conversation if we're you know if we're meeting about oh project x my brain is going let's let's talk about project x then it's not yes. think it doesn't chuck in a few questions of oh i wonder how sandra their partner is doing you know after after that brief sickness like that's that's something i consciously have to do rather than my brain just offering me mm -hmm. and um i think it wasn't until later that i realized that that um I suppose two things. One, that isn't consistent for everyone. Like some people that that happens more naturally. But also, two, I'm not alone in that either. It's, you know, mm. the, there are lots of people that struggle with that and and having that small term. So I, I think I feared that more than I needed to. I was worried that I couldn't be a good manager if I wasn't creating those that kind of connection. Um, mm. I realize now that that isn't necessarily how you create that kind of connection. There's, there's better ways. <laughs> and yes. also there are other ways in which you can have reminders to do it. Like as part of my weekly one to ones, I have a document that I use to have that conversation that includes prompts like <laughs> how's your week <laughs> been overall? And, you know, yes. uh, um, sh you know, t uh, share with me some wins, you know, or what's causing you most frustration. Like those are questions that you can literally have as prompts to help you remember to ask. You don't need to be an amazing pe people person <laughs> for that no, to exist. No. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing that was holding me back was delegation. I really struggled. I was, you know, I'm, um, I think I've uh, I struggled a lot with being essentially a bit of a control freak, uh, right. being a bit neurotic and and mm. just worrying about everything. And as a result, really struggling to just let go, you know, mm. uh, um, and, and and pass things to people. Um, but it was, but what's awesome is that although I found that really hard, and that for years I feel it set me back on my entrepreneurial journey, arguably overcoming that particular challenge has made me uh and particularly uh one of my businesses air manual has made my ability to help people with growing their businesses and delegating and um, being able to free up their time and uh you know making business less stressful i'm able to do that in yeah. a way that is more powerful because i've had to start from such a weak base yeah. Like I, th I think if I was a natural given manager, like delegator born at doing that, you know, like Richard Branson always came across to me as this natural born delegator where, you know, oh, I just surround myself with smart people and I come up with these ideas and then other people like deliver it and we get these amazing results. I was the opposite end of that spectrum. <laughs> and so I feel like having to overcome that has meant that I'm in a better position to be able to help other business leaders to be able to kind of uh, do that uh, too. 100%, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense because 
if you you now have more empathy with other people that mm. might be struggling because you know where you've been with that and therefore you can relate to people better that way too so when you're giving them advice or suggestions and ideas you're coming from a place of experience and therefore people will value those that kind of input uh at, you know much more so okay yeah and and i think um uh that partly i i i recognize the pain it causes mm. you know i've i've yes. been in the situations where i've because because i can't you know because i've not let go of things it means that i am needed all the time and have to mm. work all days evenings weekends or uh, or that when you know I, I then um met my now wife um you know we'd go on holiday together and i would have to come away from her i would take work calls and do work and so on or i remember at a particular point like i'd be in bed on the laptop with her lying next to me furious and unknown to me at the time plotting kicking me out and ending our relationship yes um and it was through essentially luck that I found out that that's what the situation was. And I used to turn things around and change my entire approach to, to how mm. I live my life was because I've, I've been in the darkest depths of that. I've been in the situation of slogging my guts out thinking like, Oh, well, once I get around this next corner, once I get to this key milestone, then things can be better. And business yeah. doesn't that work that way. Um, no, no, and I, and I know that for myself. I know it for family members. We talked about the uh, amazing role modeling that I got from family members that that allowed me to see that. But on the flip side, I, I saw some of those behaviors, the, the commitment to the business um, being taken to a point of not being able to be available or present and yeah. the impact that has on family members and, you know, me as a, as a, as a son and, and so on. So I knew, like when I started seeing that in myself, I knew that that was the opposite of what I wanted, and that I wanted mm. to build, um, I wanted to build businesses and and uh, you know my business portfolio or whatever, um, without everything being dependent on me and me being able to uh, spend time with family, my soulmate, with my now you know two wonderful children. That was so important to me, and I suppose that really helped um, create the motivation to overcome my biggest um you know failings and and gaps because now i had a reason you know now yeah. i had a reason not to work all hours and just decide oh you know what it'll be quicker for me to do it rather than give it to someone else so i'll do it mm. instead it's like well i know that long term i can't i can't do this long term like i can't be doing everything forever therefore i will change how things how i do yeah. things so i change that well, first of all, thank you for being so really authentic, open and honest about it, because, um, you know, that's, a, that's an amazing thing to have to share uh, so publicly. But also, I think kudos to you for recognizing it, because you could have just carried on and things would have exploded all around you. And I appreciate you had some mini explosions, but you then recognize what those were, the signs were to then change your behavior and your approach to things. Um, and it, it does take a lot of effort because lots, maybe men, but also women, you know, they don't see the signs and they will just mm. plot on and think work is the most important thing. And, yeah. you know, they're, they're pushed and by bosses, by companies, you know, their identity is so kind of engrossed in it all that you forget about the people around you. And yeah, I, I'm guilty of it too. You know, that happened to me. And that's probably why my first marriage failed. And because I was all consumed in work, employed, not self-employed, but employed, you know, which is even worse because you're working for someone else. You're, yeah. you're just getting a salary at the end of the day and, you know, giving you giving your all to it and it never ends. It just never, never ends. And you think you have to do it. Yeah, that that was kind of the failing on my side. It just kind of broke it all down. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, we learn. <laughs> we're never, never too young or old to learn. So you were, 
I kind of got you off a sidetrack because you were talking about your colleague who was also a management consultant. You were plotting a software company. Mm. So tell me what happened next after your plotting. <laughs> yeah, so after we, I think after I convinced him that I thought that I could probably sell enough consulting work to get us started, um, mm. which uh, he then he bought into uh, to his great credit uh because i uh then had to deliver on that and um uh and fortunately was able to um, and so for the first few for the first kind of uh year uh predominantly you know we we were both doing consulting with getting a little bit of time thinking about what software ideas we might build and um we then came up with our first software. I, I, or, well, we came, came up with multiple ideas and pivoted and tested them and dumped some of them because they they weren't going to work. Um, but the one that we we settled on that uh, that we then did kind of push more on was um, our first software business, which is Spider Gap, which actually started off as um, a gap analysis tool, essentially trying to solve a problem that we were trying to solve as consultants, which is helping yes. clients to work out where are they now, where do they want to get to. Um, but we found that it was really it was a hard sell in that consultants really got the value. Like they were like, yeah, this is great, but they don't want to spend any money. <laughs> um, whereas the the client like the client type organization that isn't a consultant, they need the support around it. Like they mm. need the consulting. But in our heads, we were kind of saying, well, we don't want to build a business that requires us as consultants. We want to build a software business that doesn't require that. So yeah. Um, now I look back now and realize I, I totally could have built a consulting business around a software business that doesn't require me, like that we could train up consultants and so on. But at the time I didn't realize and appreciate that. And yeah. so we pivoted a few times um, and found that actually there was a particular customer group. So we had some customers like Cisco and Autodesk who had become customers and were yeah. using our tool for 360 degree feedback. So, you know, essentially taking a particular employee and getting feedback from their manager, their peers, their direct reports and, and their own self view to help them to prioritize and plan their personal development. And yeah. those clients were super happy with the tool. Uh, they felt like we were too cheap. And so um, we kind of pivoted to focus on, on that audience. And as a result, we really started to, to grow our revenue um, uh, from there. We knew that we then were in a position where it was time to to hire, um, and we made a number of major mistakes when doing that, uh, including hiring super experienced people that you know we thought, oh well, this salesperson did a million pounds worth of sales in the previous year, they'll come and do that for our business. So didn't give them any onboarding training processes, nothing. And yeah, I mean, they couldn't even outsell what I'd been doing. And I, I at the time thought, well, I'm a rubbish salesperson. <laughs> so if they can't beat me, you know, and initially, of course, you think, oh, it's them. But then you know that they sold a million somewhere else. So, yes. Um, yeah, we kind of learned over time. And, and I think that that was it. It's like, in theory, I'd learned before that it's about people and process and that I need to hire people. And I do need to take that step. But at the same time, that didn't mean that I was going to be good at it. Right. And um it took a it took iteration it took learning through failure and continuing mm. to you know take courses and books and masterminds and coaching and all these sorts of things um but it was really when what hit us the most was that when we made a particular hire and it all started to work and it started to click and we got a salesperson in who uh, was you know we were getting a return on investment on their time and suddenly we could su finally see a way through it's like oh this is we've finally cracked it this is how we're going to grow the business and we were already yeah. i remember um paddy and i were on a we're in our annual general meeting which um because he had by that time he had moved to sweden uh, i was now living with my my soulmate in in uh, stamford in lincolnshire so previously we've been totally like close together in london we're now separate um so we would we meet we were meeting up um skiing for our annual general meeting which uh, was uh, a tradition we still do and we were basically pl plotting like oh wow this is going to go great we're going to hire 10 more of these and this is you know this is all going to be fantastic and while we were away we got an email with her handing in her notice and she'd only been with the company 11 months and um and there'd been no conversation prior it's not like oh she wants more money or whatever it was just like completely out of the blue 
And so when we when I spoke to her about why she's planning on leaving, it was all things that we should have prevented. It was yeah. that she didn't feel um, well supported, didn't feel managed, didn't feel engaged, didn't feel like she was growing, um, didn't feel clear in in some of her role and and uh, you know all these sorts of things. And and it spoke to so many of my fears, right? Like my fears around yeah. like, I'd never be a good manager was suddenly oh, coming true. No. Yeah. Um, and so, and that was devastating. Like that nearly broke us because, you know, we've been through so much pain and both financially and um, with our relationships. And this looked like the the life raft and suddenly it was like pulled away. And so it's really, really hard. But, um, and uh and fortunately, we there wasn't. Um, Paddy could have blamed me quite heavily for it because I was essentially her manager. But instead, you know, really, we we just asked questions, which is what could we have done differently? Like, how should the company look? And that moment precipitated the most significant change in our businesses that we've had, even changing product, frankly, because we suddenly. Um, uh, embarked on a journey of massively structuring our business but in terms of the processes to follow for sales and so on but also onboarding and training managing yeah. one to one you know weekly one to ones quarterly performance reviews all the meeting rhythm and pulses that you need to make sure that everyone's clear on yeah. what they're doing and all these sorts of things all the things that we didn't have in place that meant that we failed that employee mm. um, were then put in place over the following six months so it meant that when we hired her replacement, um, and by that point we felt confident that we could hire because uh, she was half, um, she was twenty hours a week. By that time, because we knew, like we knew the model could work, um, yes. we hired two full time salespeople, and it was yeah, absolutely life changing um, from that point on because suddenly we were able to bring people in that were super happy, that were a great fit because of our recruitment process, that mm. felt well-managed and supported and empowered and engaged and delivered incredible value and loved working with us and loved the company <laughs> and still are here. In fact, one of those people um, is now uh, essentially my managing director of Spider Gap. Um, he's right. the, like the COO. He, he does all the day to day and is incredible. And as you know, but joined us in the as, as one of those like salespeople in, in that time. And, Brilliant. you know, that was the big change. And it, and it meant yeah. I was able to overcome all of my barriers around not having the people <laughs> skills and, yes. um, you know, forgetting to ask, you know, how someone is and um, uh, and and de and delegating because we were we had the structure in place you know when it comes it came to delegating something the first thing that i do is capture a series of or, or particularly now i would capture a, a series of high level steps as a checklist and then i would walk through with that person and get them to follow the process to then do it which meant that i was then able to hand over um the the processes and the activities you know i was following a checklist myself to do one-to-ones with my with my staff and to do performance mm. reviews and all of that meant that success was built in. It, yeah. it wasn't something that relied on me using my brain and emotional intelligence to suddenly be a good manager. I was able to, mm. to follow, the, follow the steps. And that's meant that we've been able to set up other managers in the team who have, in most cases, have managed people for the first time ever. And yet they're regarded as the best, you know, the, some of the best managers wow. that those, those wow. people have ever had. And so... It really, it, for me, it's my story is a journey of taking my biggest weaknesses and overcoming and and, and addressing them with some of my biggest strengths of you know yes. be, of the things I had learned, um, and ultimately as a result being able to let go to the point that with Spider Gap, I'm not required day to day, I'm not required day to uh, week to week, to the point that in summer of this year I took a six week road trip with my wife and family in a motorhome, um, spending time with them across Europe. Paddy, meanwhile, was on a four week holiday with with uh, his family, you know, and we, we've been able to step out the business and do the amazing things that we wanted to to do um, whilst empowering the team and allowing them to do the same if they want to. Like every everyone in our company has got 40 days holiday because we don't just want we don't just want that for us. We want it for everyone. You know, the as, as you say, like the problem of going, you know, over investing in your work and as a result leading to divorce or yeah. not spending time with your kids or suicide or burnout or all these sorts of things mm. Mm. they are not 
um, exclusive to business leaders, although they are very common for business leaders. They do happen yeah. for employees as well as, yes. as you described. Um, and yet, and so that's why it's really important for us to make sure that that's not something we're creating in our, in our company, um, having had that pain ourselves. And so that's been the biggest thing for us is that now, you know, we've now built another software business, Air Manual, where we literally are helping business leaders every day to free up their time and uh, remove themselves from the day to day of the business and be able to get people on board and into the team and managed and developed, regardless of the skills and natural abilities <laughs> that those people I have. Mean, do you, I mean, you may know this as well. I mean, when I used to manage people many, many years, mm. you know, when I got from like somebody who did stuff to become managing people, I actually started at a very, very young age. But um, there, there always used to be this myth about management because what used to happen, if you did a good job in your expert field, then now you can become a manager. Yeah. You know, your next promotion is you've done a good job in the day-to-day -day kind of tasky stuff and you do you deliver really well. Now you can manage people because you are the best at that tasky stuff. So you can train the other people type of thing. But of course, with that goes people management, which is mm. the biggest part, which you've not been trained in. No. And you probably had and no then, developer in it. Yeah. Nothing, <laughs> no development nothing, in it zero. Yeah, zero. I mean, it's a bit like, you'll know this, I've never had children of my own, but I've got two stepkids, but there is no manual for <laughs> children, for parenting children. I mean, you can read books, but there is no handbook. Not for your you know? children. Yeah. Not like for there's, your there's children. books for children in general, but they're all different. and They're yeah. all unique. Yeah. No, my children are unique. You know, they... Well, all children go through puberty. No, no, mine have really gone through puberty, you know. <laughs> and so, um, but also there used to be this myth where it says, well, managers are born. You know, you're a born man. If you mm. are leaders, you oh, know, leaders are born. They're thing. not trained, yeah. you know. They, they, they come readily made. You're either a born leader or you're not type of thing. But well, what you're reason, saying yeah. is that's not true. It's not true. Uh, yeah. I can now um, say categorically that's not true. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're doing and proving, not just with your own journey, but now you're helping people to do replicate what you went through with other people with your software. So talk to me more about this amazing name. And so when I saw the name Air Manual, I went, OK, so he must be working on airplanes then. And this is a <laughs> manual to build small aircraft, is it? <laughs> Afraid not. No, no, that, <laughs> that, that, that would be cool. <laughs> Although you can absolutely create a checklist in air manual on how to, uh, to build a plane. Although perhaps that's a confusing way of exploring it. Um, yeah. no, so it's, it's more like a manual in the air in the sense of being in on the, in the cloud, you know, in, uh, into the yes. computer terms. And yes. so the idea, um, really comes from our own experience trying to build the business where, you know, you create these, you create documentation and most business leaders uh, and uh, frankly, most, most people in businesses generally have come across some form of business process documentation, whether it's, you know, uh, a flow chart or whether it's some uh, SOPs, you know, standard yes. operating procedures that explain how stuff must be done. Yeah. And um, businesses that don't have those in place feel the pain like yeah. stuff's a mess it's inconsistent when someone leaves or is sick or whatever that's yeah. got the process in their brain it creates huge amounts of stress for everyone involved you either need to contact them which is awful if they've just gone through a bereavement or you yes. have to muddle through and you make loads of mistakes and it's really expensive and takes lots of time or you're the business owner and stuff can only happen with you because you're the only one that knows how to send the invoice correctly or uh, run a particular part of the project or whatever it is or um, is the only person that uh, knows how to run the interview for a new hire and and so business becomes really stressful tiring yeah. and and uh, and and impossible to do whilst also taking lots of lovely time off and being present with your family and all these sorts of things if mm. you don't have processes in place problem is that even the businesses who have got processes 
find that those documents are typically like word documents and uh you know mix of google docs and powerpoints and flowcharts and whatever and in a mess of places or in a binder that sits on a shelf and it gathers yeah. dust and it goes out of date and no one uses it for training and so as a result when someone gets hired into the, the organization their training is basically based on whatever the manager can remember of their own training um and it's it's not consistent it's not effective and it takes a huge amount of time for everyone. It's not very rewarding and enjoyable, and um, uh, which is a shame because it's a, meant to be an exciting time for a new the new joiner, but it's also an, one yeah. that causes great anxiety. Um, but also you don't get great results because people aren't doing things consistently and they aren't keeping things up to date and they aren't improving. Um, and that's a problem that we you know faced ourselves. And in theory, mm. it was one that I was meant to be solving for businesses back when I was a consultant. But it was, it was only really through solving that in our own business that we realized that there's a, a new approach or a better approach to doing that um, where you are able to have your processes uh, in a single place that's easy for people to find and use. And you need to remove the friction so that people can actually use the process to do the day-to-day -day and that they can track where they're up to, which isn't yeah. possible for using Word and all these sorts of things. Um, you just you can't you can't track where you're up to and therefore it slows you down because when you leave uh, you know when you go away for to go do something else and you come back it takes a while to work out where you're at and on all this sort of stuff and you end up not kind of using the process you end up using like from memory um, but then the other problem is that if you can't quickly make updates to it like you know if you've got everything as pdfs or or you've got it in asana or monday.com or whatever where you can't update the underlying template and it then affects all of the checklists that you've got you know if we take the um old school version would be that you've got your printed process and when you yes. want to check this you'd photocopy that and go and tick it off as you go along but of course yeah. if you want to make an improvement to it <laughs> you you can update the original document but that doesn't update all the printouts that you've got and so um, we wanted to create something that would do that and remove that friction. But then the other crucial thing was how do you make all of it easy to manage? Because mm. e even if you do that, even if you have some documents that are interactive and so on, how do you make it possible that very quickly across your finance team or your marketing team or whatever, HR, that they can see what are we meant to have done? What's coming up next? What's overdue? What documents should we have updated by now? Um who who needs to do all of that? And if you can't easily get a view of that in less than five minutes, it doesn't happen. And that's mm. what we found in our business. And what what it, the outcome of that is that either it doesn't happen at all, so um, uh, you know everything goes out of date, and as a result, you just end up with low documents that gather dust, and you back to emails when I've not had them. Or it takes so much work for managers and the business leader that it's almost like you've got the same problem as before. Like the business becomes dependent on the business leader as I, because I got into that situation where yeah. yes, I was, I'd removed myself from the day to day of doing the doing, but now my new job was constantly having to be the only one that knew how to update the documents and knew how to update a process or create new process or whatever. Like that was, that was my new job in the business. And, <laughs> and I remember like being pulled away from holiday like time at the pool with my family because I was the only person who knew that kind of stuff. And, Yes. And so that's what we had to that's what we had to overcome first in our own business. And then we created through Air Manual, including both the tool to remove all the friction, but actually it's as much about creating a process culture. It's about yeah. creating a, a setup in your business that means that your team are empowered and able to create and use and update processes. And you can, you know, control who can do bit which bit and so on. But like mm. One, when you've got to that point, then you're truly free. That's when yeah. you can, because then the cycle changes rather than constantly going through pain of, oh, there's a mistake. As a result, you have to go and fix it. You know, you're firefighting all the time. You're struggling with time to be able to do anything. As a yes. result, you think I probably need to hire or pay or delegate more, but it takes me ages. I may as well have done it myself. And you end up through this cycle of process yeah. pain. Yeah, yeah. Instead, when you shift to this new approach or this different approach, like instead, you know, we call it process paradise because instead when you do it the the way that we've we've developed, it takes less than 30 minutes to delegate a process and delegate something to someone else. 
And then whenever there are mistakes or questions, you fix the process as you go along so that you don't get those those never reoccur. It's not just firefighting, which frees you up, which means because it mean, now means the team are able to do it without you, which means that you can then spend your time working on the business on things that will grow it, like identifying new marketing channels or strategic partnerships or identifying what's the next big high uh, you know, person you need to hire. Hmm. And then you repeat that cycle, you know, once you've worked out what works, you can then document that and get that past someone and, and constantly free it with time. And and so it's it's properly life changing. And that's one of the things I love most about what we're doing at Air Manual is it's not it no longer feels like and my goal is not build a big, big global business empire that doesn't excite me. You know, that goal that I set when I was 12, 13 hmm. years old is not what I'm working towards. What excites me and I love the most is helping as many business leaders as I can to avoid yeah. the trap of thinking success or a big milestone is just around the corner. When I get there, then I will spend time with the people that matter most to me. Then yeah. I will reduce yes. the stress in my team. Then I will remove the burnout and the pain and the upset and, and so on. And then I will be able to add more impact to the world. doesn't mm. work that way. You have to you have to enjoy the journey and you have to put the structures in place that give you the freedom. If you yeah. if you don't have the structure, you get chaos and chaos just takes up too much time and energy. And therefore, it, it doesn't create it doesn't create the space for you to have that impact on yourself and the people you love and your team and the wider world. Brilliant. Thank you for that. And I, I love the fact of that your goals have changed in that respect and that it's not about becoming a, you know, multi-billion dollar corporation. You may still will become one, but... <laughs> By uh, accident, though. <laughs> well, so, somebody might buy you, right? Um, <laughs> one of these people, they go, they've got an e-product, you know, Microsoft or somebody. But what, what, um, what I'm curious about is, what kind of size companies is this aimed at? Yeah, so so we work with a with a variety of sizes. So um, the smallest tend to be around the kind of three, four, five team members. Where yeah, um, uh, and they don't need to necessarily be employees. They might be uh, that they might have freelancers and contractors yes. that are supporting yes. them. Um, but they're they're typically. Um, business, business owners who are starting to realize like I do need to free up my team I do need to be delegating these things in theory we could you know we can work we, we'd be valuable to business leaders who are just you know one-man bands and looking to free up their time like that's the crucial yeah. thing you've got you've mm -hmm. got to be working towards that um, so we do start with, from as low as that and we've got a, a starter package which uh, essentially covers that in terms of the tool um, but mm. we then like uh, the sweet spot, typically businesses, when they start to get to six, seven, eight, nine, ten, up to 12, 15 employees, that's where they're really starting to feel this pain, you know, where yeah. where you can't cope just by having, you know, uh, stuff in people's heads or uh, some poor documentation and, and using a mix of Asana and Loom and all these sorts of mess of tools like you need you need everything in one place and it needs to be easy, mm. easy to use and so on. Um, however, we do work with some very large businesses as well, um, including yeah. you know businesses like Sony and Thomas Cook and um, uh, and and some other uh, large ones like and PLCs. Um, but typically, divisions where you've got some smart leader who's gone, yeah, I'm like you know, we worked with um, a division of a of a PLC recently where um, they had basically like the the sales team had nearly walked out over the course of about a month. Um, and so they they hired a new sales manager and that sales manager needed to get a brand new sales team up to speed in in uh, in basically six weeks whilst also running the sales themselves so that you're keeping the lights on. Um, and fortunately, yeah, they, we had a conversation and we helped them document all of their processes and onboarding. So it meant that they were able to get that the five new sales team members up to speed and delivering value in a week without that sales manager having to spend all their time spoon feeding and delivering training and so on. Um, and so now you've got a team that's performing and has been doing, you know, from a few weeks in the role rather than, you know, I know some businesses who would say that it takes uh, certainly months, sometimes years for their sales yes. team to get up to, uh, up to scratch and delivering value. Um, you know, it's, um, 
and so so we we do we do have a bit of a mix but yeah that kind of gives you a sense of where the sweets thank you yeah that's very useful and would you say i mean i'm not trying to pigeonhole you but it helps maybe listeners to kind of go where does this fit and would you say it falls in the kind of lean bracket of process engineering i mean i used to be involved uh goes back a long time i used to be in the textile industry for 28 Mm -hmm. years and uh you may have come across something called TQM, Edward Deming. Yeah, total quality management, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, with the kind of things you were describing, you know, we didn't have processes. I was on the sales side and I hated having to write down sales processes. Yeah. You know, it was not good feeling at all uh, having to do that because they were in manuals, you know, yeah. in plastic pockets or whatever. And sales processes did change frequently. Yeah often because you have to be nimble and change the way you're doing things because the market changes so quickly every season it changes so you kind of go okay you've got to update the manual you gotta be kidding you know i need to be out on the street with my bag of swatches going to the designers <laughs> and show them the new range i haven't got time to do, do you want the factory full next year or no. not you know so um, yeah. So, so yeah, so, does it fall into kind of lean TQM that area or? Yeah. So I mean, my 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 background as a process consultant means that I've had experience of all of those TQM, lean, Six Sigma, and and so on. That's it, Six Sigma. Um, yeah. And and uh, I'd say that um, essentially, yes, this supports the delivery of those things. But for a lot yes. of the businesses we work with, they're not familiar with with any of those models. But essentially, right. you're kind of creating it by virtue of the way that we work with them, which is yes. nice. Yes, yes. Um, but the the key, like, if, if, if I use an example, because as you say, like in sales, the salespeople don't want to spend a lot of time documenting process and so on. So no. And let's let's take, um, I hired two salespeople on the same day in November uh, last year. And uh, one of the reasons I hired them was because I was busy with sales. Like I, you know, I was kind of growing Air Manual and uh, my diary was getting pretty full. And so I knew I needed to hire more people to to free up my time again. But at the same time, I don't want sales to grind to a halt. I don't have to say to all these business leaders, oh, sorry, you know, I'm, I'm going to spend the next three weeks training my salespeople. So no. um, you're going to have to wait. So what what we what I did is created the 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 step by step. Here's how I do a, a discovery call with a customer. Here's how I send an invoice when they're ready to go ahead. Here's how I uh, you know do all these things. So as a business leader, just getting those things down. And for some of our customers, they want that sucked out of their head with a straw because it's just too difficult to get out their heads. And so that's why we have sales consultants in our or and consultants in our team who do that exact thing with our customers right. to like get it get it documented for them. But even when we do- help them document it, the aim is still that they and their teams are able to make changes. So a good example of this would be the salespeople that I hired, um, both of them starting. I've got everything documented. So in total, it took an hour and a half of my time in that week to, to support them because the, most yeah. of it is self-driven. So I'm not going to spend 20 hours with each of them training them. Instead, no. they're learning it and coming to me with questions. But the the really cool thing is one of them would ask me a question. So they might say, oh, I've I spotted that over on this document. It says that we don't do this. But then I saw in this document, it says we do. Which one is right? And I'd go, oh, that's a really good point. That one's out of date. We now do offer it. And then here's the crucial thing. I'd say, please now update it. And they loved it because they're asking a question, which they're asking because it matters. Yes. They've now got the answer. And because of the way in which the tool works, like the friction's gone. It's literally click edit and they make the change and click publish, done. And now not only have they got it there so that when they come back, when they're doing a sales call with a customer, it's it's there for them. They don't have to try and remember. But also the other salesperson didn't even ask me the question. Because, of course, it was already correct in their onboarding when they came to it. And I think that's the key. And that's why I say it's like, what we what we learned and what we had to build in air manual is removing the friction like as soon as there's any friction like you say like you as a salesperson you you kind of think oh i haven't got time to update the process no and so we had to overcome that we had to make it so fast that you can do it at the point that you think of it 
like when I'm walking through a process with my finance administrator and she get and, and we go, oh, oh, that's a point. We should have we should really have a step where we do X before we do Y. Mm. Now, if she captures that as a to do, it might yeah. not happen. Yeah. And if she even if she does, she might capture it, but she might capture it the wrong way round because mm. she's misunderstood me. And then we have to have another conversation when a mistake is made and so on. It like just adds more and more time. Whereas mm. what we did with her money is make it so that at the point that you spot it, you can just click edit, change it, wow. publish, done. Oh, and, and that's just one aspect. And, 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 you know, a lot of what we've done is essentially just removing the friction so that the team can manage and feel it and, and be empowered to, to do that. And so that as the business leader, you don't have to be the owner of everything and be responsible for updating. You can empower the team to, to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about nonprofits, Alexis? Are you supporting any nonprofits, or it does it kind of work for nonprofits? Uh, it would work for it would work for nonprofits. Um, I must admit, I think because of where we've been doing our marketing, although we have a lot of nonprofits for our other um, software uh, tool uh, for Spider Gap, where we offer, I think we offer like a, uh, a a discount for them, so that it's kind of more at cost. Uh, for that um for air manual i think because i've predominantly been speaking at events for entrepreneurs business owners yes. and and so on that's not come up as often um but mm. i'd uh, be, i'd uh, yeah i'd love the opportunity to work with some non-profits and help them to uh, improve their efficiency of course it's relevant there too right particularly where you've got volunteer workforces where um, you need to be able to get people up to speed without having to spend a load of time training them, particularly because they can leave at any point and they're probably not working full time and so on. So, so yeah, it's so, so appropriate for nonprofits. Mm. I believe me, I've I've been involved with nonprofits and yeah, they desperately need something because at the end of the day, they need to be cost saving because the money they've raised needs to go to their cause, not Absolutely. being spent internally on processes that are totally inefficient yeah and so, it's so common that they are unfortunately i think partly because of the the nature of um uh, the nature of some of the workforce and kind of things that they have to deal with to uh, to make that work so yeah, yeah. No, I, I think i i completely agree there so i'm conscious that we perhaps haven't spent enough time on spider gap <laughs> that's okay no i'm 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 i'm, I'm good <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, what if if you were to sum it up in kind of one sentence? What because it's two businesses you run, right? Spider Gap and Air Manual, or any others? Uh, yeah, we still have the consultancy, and in fact, my um, it was uh, a great source of joy for me that my wife a few years ago um, uh, got asked whether she'd do some consulting for a business because uh, she's got a marketing background. Um, uh, she was a marketing director for PLCs. Um, she got asked to do some consulting, and so she now heads up the consulting side of the business. Brilliant. So that's essentially three active at the moment. Um, yes. I sold I sold another business that I was doing um, earlier this year. Um, and next to another one so um so yeah at the moment three active ones um bridging insight the consultancy spider gap okay three seats feedback tool and uh, air manual the process and onboarding tool sometimes it's good to leave people with being more curious and wanting to get in touch with you to learn more isn't it so absolutely <laughs> why don't you share with us how people could get in touch with you yeah, sure. So I'm I'm uh, pretty active on social media, particularly on uh, LinkedIn, but you can find me on Instagram and um, uh, TikTok and Facebook as well. I'm Alexis Kingsbury. There aren't many of me. Uh, there's certainly not many that are male and there's only one that's the co-founder of, the, of Air Manual. So uh, yeah. you should find me, should find me on there. Um, I also recommend if people are interested in kind of removing the stress from the business, um, check out destressyourbusiness.com, which is where you'll find our podcast uh, where we've been uh, we've been doing some LinkedIn lives and recording them as podcasts um, covering like, a number of areas on how do you remove the stress from the business? Like today, yeah. uh, earlier today, I did one on uh, the importance of core values and how mm. that helps you to uh, kind of remove the stress. Over last, uh, last week, we were doing all about recruitment and how to make that work really well and remove the stress both for um, the leaders, the managers, the team, and the, uh, and the candidates. Prior to that, we've done onboarding. So we've you know, got, and we go deep into, into these topics. So I think it can really help people to, to you know, perform 
um, yeah. uh, solve some really big problems and do so by reducing the stress. Um, and also I run a weekly or typically weekly webinar, um, which uh, is available at airmanual.co forward slash webinar, where people can join and interact with me and uh, ask me their Fabulous. biggest questions. Um, where typically the topic is on how to free up 15 hours per week and remove the constant stress of running a business uh, without slowing down growth. In fact, um, I can show you how to exactly unlock it. And so, we, you know, I cover cover the approaches um, that, that we've kind of talked about and alluded to uh, uh, today of how do you do it? How do you save like two days a week out of your time? How do you make delegation easy? How do you onboard people eight times faster and with 80% less effort, you know, all those sorts of things, which sound crazy. Like how could you possibly achieve it? And on the webinar, we kind of show exactly how you can do it. So, so that's, um, that's a good, good place to reach me as well. And then of course, people can email me at alexis.kingsbury at airmanual.co uh, as you might expect for, um, uh, for someone who advocates delegation and freeing up yourself on the day to day. Uh, I have a, uh, I have team members who review the the inbox, but uh, that's uh, that, that's another great way to reach me, and uh, uh, we do respond uh, promptly to those. <laughs> Fantastic! Well, that's a lot for people to get involved and start listening and discovering and building some trust with you. I I think there is room sometime in the future. I would love to do a social audio on LinkedIn with you. That'd be um, great. You know, have a specific chat. It might be appropriate to talk about recruiting, especially on LinkedIn, but leadership equally would be a really big topic on LinkedIn as well. So Love yeah, to. let me have a think about that because although we can't record yet, and I'm kind of almost saying uh, it would perhaps be better if we could record it, of course, um, but I'm just thinking out loud. It's just another idea how to, to get in front of people. That All sounds right. good to me. Alexis, thank you so much. I'm conscious... I'm keeping you from your family. So (laughs) uh, I appreciate your time. It's super interesting what you've been up to. Thank you so much for sharing your story so openly and honestly. I think it's been invaluable. And uh, if you're ever in the Birmingham area, it's about 40 minutes for me to get there. But yeah, I wouldn't mind meeting up and having a cup of coffee or a bite to eat. I'd love that. No, I'd I'd really appreciate that, Michael. And it's it's been it's been great talking to you. Thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me to share my story. And um, yeah, I really hope it's uh, it's helped people. I'm sure it will. Bye for now. Cheers. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.